Hello, everybody. Today I have a special guest, Paloma Varela. Welcome and uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much. Very kind of you to have invited me. Well, I'm what I what you would call a uh, an old Californian soul. Uh, I lived in California for many years until I was a young woman and then I moved to Mexico. Uh, typical story, fell in love with a Mexican man, got married, had three children, and I've lived here the rest of my life. Uh, that's great, thank you. Uh, your bicultural background, as you were saying, Mexi is Mexican and American. Uh, which makes you a perfect person to talk about the book I have in mind, Esperanza Rising. Uh, the author of the book, Pam Munoz Ryan, is Mexican-American and uh, relies loosely on her grandmother's life to uh, write the story of Esperanza Rising. Uh, please allow me to tell our viewers a little bit about the book, then we can discuss some uh, ideas together. Okay, fine. So Esperanza is the main character of the book, a 13-year-old girl that lives in a beautiful ranch in Mexico, El Rancho de las Rosas. She has a privileged life with lots of toys, elegant dresses, and with servants doing her bidding. Her father, the head of the family, is generous and kind to everyone on the ranch, including the servants. Unfortunately, he is killed by bandits, and the whole, er uh, and the whole wealth of the family is inherited by his brother. When Esperanza's mother refuses to marry her brother-in-law, the women of the family have to leave together with the servants. Abuelita, the, grandma, the grandmother, strains an ankle and has to stay behind to recover. Esperanza and her mother, together with the family of servants, Hortensia, Alfonso, and their son Miguel, go into the, uh, go into the United States. They end up in a camp for Mexican farm workers in California. Esperanza's life is unrecognizable as she loses everything and needs to adapt to the new life. When her mother is hospitalized, she remains on her own and relies on the help of her old servants and she also makes new friends among the immigrants. She has to rise above the, the tough circumstances and, and to work hard to survive. Let's start with the title of the book. Uh, the original title is Esperanza Rising, uh, which nicely summarizes uh, the plot and the highlights of the bilingual and bicultural experience that the book offers. Uh, in Romanian, though, that doesn't uh, really work, so it was published with the title Roses from Mexico. Do you think that's a good title and do roses have a special place in the Mexican culture? Um, if you look at the Romanian cover, does it, just, does it suggest Mexico to you? Okay, well, let's see. First question, yes. Uh, here is uh, uh, the cover. Wait. The, yes, yeah, sure. There, let's see it. Okay. Um, yes, it does suggest Mexico. I'm not an expert in this field, but yes, it does suggest Mexico. Although the rose is not the official uh, flower of Mexico, Dahlia is the official flower of Mexico. Roses have a very important uh, religious connection with Mexican society. Many of the people here are Catholic. There is a virgin and she, there is a legend of an, uh, of an Indian who saw the virgin. He picked up some rocks from the ground and after she blessed, him they turn into roses that's a very beautiful romantic story yeah. and the other thing is that uh, mexicans are very passionate they it's all about love and fidelity very intense the latin roots and uh red roses are a must among lovers so i guess it it does it does have a connection with mexican culture Yes, yes. There is one aspect of the book that is not clear to somebody who's not familiar with your culture and history. To my mind, it would be easier for Esperanza and her family to move out of the ranch and stay in Mexico. Uh, then I read a bit of, about the fact that the first two decades of the 20th century were filled with turmoil and, uh, and unrest in Mexico. Uh, could it justify why the family has to run to the US? Well, yes, uh, I can I can really relate to the situation. I understand why they did this, because in those days, there was a lot of turmoil here in Mexico. There were several factions that were fighting and struggling uh, to uh, take down the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. And uh, my great grandparents and grandparents, they lived in Chihuahua. 
and they had a, a ranch, a hacienda over there, and they grew peaches. And then one day the bandits came in and they burned everything down. So they just had to leave. They moved to California. And it was easy in those days because there were no borders, or if there were some borders, I mean, we didn't really need a passport. So um, they were probably afraid of that. The other thing was that uh, in those days, if you had money, cash, paper, money, today you had uh, the, uh, the face of someone, some uh, one of the heroes of the revolution was there. The following day, there was a new print of paper. So this changed a lot and a lot of people lost a lot of their money. So many of the people kept the money in gold. Instead of having bills, they had gold. So it, they were easy for, it was easy for the bandits to go there and steal their money. Yeah, uh, we can see a few similarities uh, to the story I just told about uh, Esperanza story. Uh, Esperanza uh, always thinks about what her father told her. Uh, wait a little while and fruit will fall into your hand. Uh, this links to the fact that the author chose only fruits and fruit and vegetables to name the chapters of the book. They refer both to the harvest taking place in their respective chapter and to what is happening to the characters. I thought that was very creative. In Romania, we often uh, say that our traditional culture is agricultural. Uh, can we say the same about the Mexican culture? I guess it's it, it is uh, we have a very important agricultural culture. It's a bit ho holistic in some areas. For example, in Xochimilco, we have what we call the chinampas, which are uh, little sh over shallow lakes. They've created these farming areas, and it has this mystical uh thing where they uh, burn incense every year and they grow the crops and there's legends and stories and you can travel like in venice but around the chinampas and now they have some very good organic chinampas where they are growing they have sustainable crops but i mean this this started from the time of the aztecs so there is a, a cosmovision of communication the, the mm -hmm. yes yes i guess it is and the other thing is you can find in mexico whatever whenever you want vegetables fruits all year round mm -hmm. yeah uh, another interesting thing about this book is that in the book the women have to leave the ranch because the land and the mansion are passed on to the uncle because the women had no right to own land uh, I was uh, curious to look into the current situation in Mexico. I was actually surprised to discover that it is still men who have the right to own arable land. More than half of the land is owned by an ejido, a collective agricultural plot, but the ownership of the land is still only men's rights. The 1992 reform of the agrarian law reinforced that only men can be custodians of the ownership rights. How do you think this affects the rights of the Mexican women in general? Well, uh, I was doing a bit of research and I believe it has changed in some states. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in areas such as Oaxaca and Sonora, which are very important farmlands, it is changing. Now there's, uh, I was reading that there is a percentage of women who are now beginning to be in charge of the ejido rights. Mm -hmm. So it's a slow process, but yes, it is happening. Uh, as a result, of, we have a lot of women who are uh, uh, agriculture engineers, that's what they call them here, and they design new ways of farming, uh, farming without the use of earth, air farming, I believe it's called aero farming, I'm not sure, there's a name for that. Well, you you farm, but you don't um, you don't use the earth, the soil, you do it on air, and there's a lot of women who are involved in this type of situations. So it's changing, it's changing a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the themes that runs through the book is family and its importance. Family seems to be Esperanza's energy source. Even after her father dies, her mother is hospitalized and her grandmother is far away. Would you say family is a defining aspect of the Mexican culture? It's definitely a defining aspect of the culture. I guess that's the reason why so many people uh, find it uh, 
appealing to be part of this culture. It's everybody's always into everybody's business. Uh, the families are always there. If someone is sick, everybody goes and see him. If it's someone's party, uh, you end up with not only your close family members, but a gazillion relatives and pseudo relatives that are right there. Yes, uh, family is an important issue here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the modern perspective, we are outraged by many aspects of the book, like child labor, poverty, racism, uh, and immigration. While many aspects have been solved in most modern societies, we can't ignore the fact that uh, others are painfully current. Forced immigration still is still happening to our Ukrainian neighbors. Um, you aren't necessarily close geographically to the war in Ukraine, but I know uh, you've been touched by what is happening uh, here. As a teacher, what do you think is the role of education in dealing with immigrants, integration, racism and gender equality? Um, education is everything. Education is the only way that a country can grow is by educating and taking care of their young ones. Uh, we have a problem here, like many countries, we have the extreme comfort, people who live in extreme wealth, uh, mid-class who are surviving, and we have the poor people. Now, uh, it is very difficult here because Mexico has made, there are many shades to Mexico. Uh, right now, I'm living in a place called Yucatan, which is another Mexico. It's like living in another country. The way the people think, the way the people do, their time frames, everything is so different. So uh, the only way that you can actually get rid of all these um, biases is by educating people, uh, starting by accepting ourselves in who we are, what we believe in. And the more we accept ourselves, we will be able to be nicer and be more tolerant with the rest of the people. That can only be achieved through education. Indeed, education is very important and is a key to Absolutely. many factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, so, so much. I'm uh, gr very grateful that you accepted to talk to me about the book and, you know, uh, some discussion points that uh, it offers. Thank you very much, Yanis. It's been a pleasure. I am honored and I will I'm with your number one fan, you know that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. If you have any book recommendations, please leave them down in the comments. Bye. Bye-bye.